Okay, so today I would like to tell you about our quantum advantage result. And this is a joint work with Xavier Quatrochua and Robert Koenig. And so our work is not about uh, quantum advantage against efficient classical computation, where we can only get results which are based on some complexity theory assumptions, but we will restrict ourselves to um, some restricted models of computations, those of shallow depth classical circuits and shallow depth quantum circuits. And there we can actually prove some unconditional results. <clears throat> but uh, how do we want to target this? We want to go somehow close to what is physically realizable. So we will consider noisy circuits with some local geometry, for example, 3D local geometry. And what we would like to have is uh, we want to have some strongest quantum advantage that we can get. So we will consider also some unbounded input gates for the classical circuits. Okay, so let me uh, briefly tell you about some types of shallow depth circuits. So the most basic one is something which is called NC0. And this is a um, class of circuits, which it's a classical, uh, those are classical circuits, which has bounded Fenning gates, and they have constant depth. <clears throat> The depth uh, means that uh, it is the longest path uh, between any input to any output, and the fanin is the number of inputs to a gate. But we will be sorry, we will be more interested in AC0, which is actually the type of circuits uh, to which we are targeting our quantum advantage. And those circuits can also contain some unbounded Fenin gates, like unbounded end and unbounded OR. And we will also be talking about the size of this circuit for which we need polynomial size. And the size is number of gates. So what is the relation between those uh, circuits? So by a simple Litecon argument, where you just simply trace out what kind of input inputs influence the output, you can see that you cannot compute end on all of the input bits by this type of circuits. But you can do it in the AC0 circuits. <clears throat> OK, <clears throat> and you can also show that there are things which you cannot compute with the AC0 circuits. So for example, you cannot compute parity. And uh, this can be done by something which is called restriction-based methods, about which I will tell you a little bit later. And <clears throat> so you might kind of think like how far we can get with this. So let's say that we add there the parity. And uh, we, we consider circuits which also can compute parity. And uh, you might be wondering how far we can get with these unconditional separations. And actually, not, uh, not that much far above this AC0 with parity, this AC02. Actually, if you consider a mod gates, which, uh, which computes modulo of a um, product of two distinct prime numbers, then we don't even know whether they, they don't contain NP complexity class. Okay, so how to show uh, circuit lower bounds for AC0 circuits? This will be done by, or one of the methods is random restrictions, where we choose uh, some inputs randomly and we fix them to uh, random values. And for what I would like to give you a, a little bit of intuition is that if we do this, then uh, these random restrictions will severely simplify AC0 circuits and or, and the functions which survives this random restriction, such as parity, they will be hard for AC0 circuits. Okay, so how to somehow get an intuition behind this is by viewing this AC0 circuits in their normal form. And actually, this is where this name AC comes from. It's uh, the A stands for alternating and C for circuits. So those are circuits which has alternating uh, layers of ends and or gates. <clears throat> and the main technical thing there will be something which is called switching lemmas, where what we would like to do is we would like to switch uh, the consecutive layers of end and ors and see what happens. And 
So if you do it without these restrictions, this can blow up your circuit exponentially. But if you apply restrictions here, then what happens is that it actually simplifies your circuit in a way that it will not blow up. OK, so what you can do is that you can apply this inductively and you can shave off your circuit up to just two layers. So by these random restrictions, you will end up with a small depth to AC0 circuit. <clears throat> and, the, and the typical proof is this kind of switching lemmas will be, so let's say that we want to prove that you cannot compute parity by AC0 circuit. So you show that uh, by these uh, random restrictions, you will need to have a small depth to circuit. But uh, if you consider a circuit that should have computed parity, then on the remaining free inputs, it has to compute either parity or the negation of parity. And then you show that you need to have a very large, exponentially large circuit to compute parity if you have just depth two. And this will give you the result that you cannot compute parity in AC0. <clears throat> but we will be using some kind of uh, newer types of switching lemmas, which are stronger and possibly with some additional restrictions where you take the random restrictions and it, it tells you that you have to um, restrict some additional inputs to random variables. <clears throat> and uh, and the result of this thing, at least in some operational meaning, will be that if this was AC0 circuit, then this restricted circuit could be implemented by this NC0 circuits with high probability. And I recall th that this NC0 circuit, uh, this was the bounded Fenin constant depth circuit. <clears throat> and the number of inputs, uh, which are still free, will be somehow sufficiently large. Okay, but let me get back to the quantum circuits. So there is an analog of this NC0 complexity class, which is called QNC0. And those are just constant depth uh, quantum circuits, which could possibly use some ancillas. So where those fit? So if you consider only decision problems, then you will not have any quantum advantage with those because you can, again, trace out some kind of light con argument. And because everything has constant uh, degree, then you can just uh, simulate it by NC0 circuit. So there is no quantum advantage there. But if you consider relation or search problems uh, where you have multiple output bits, then you can actually get some quantum advantage. And there is actually, uh, right now, quite a bunch of results uh, regarding this. So uh, we know that uh, those circuits um, cannot be simulated by NC0 circuit or AC0 circuits. And there is even a result, which is under complexity theory assumption by Terhal and Di Vincenzo, that unless polynomial hierarchy collapses, then you cannot even efficiently simulate them. <clears throat> and uh, this is where our result will fit in. So we will consider 3D local circuits because we are trying to target something which is uh, close to something being physically realizable. <clears throat> okay, so uh, first we need to consider a noiseless case uh, for which we prove that 1D local QNC0 circuits are not in AC0. <clears throat> and uh, the main, so we will be dealing with gate teleportation circuits and the main building block of this is gate teleportation, where we take some unknown quantum state and we teleport it through a Bell state on which we a priori applied some unitary gate. And now if you do this, then what you end up with is, uh, is this unknown quantum state, which is corrupted by a Pauli error, which is determined by the result of the Bell measurement. And you have this unitary U applied to it. Mm. Okay. And in the typical scenarios, what you do, you apply a correction and, uh, and get back to the state that you would like. But what we will consider, we will not do these corrections, actually. So here, if you, let's say that I have an n qubit state and those unitaries, um, they are two qubit unitaries, and I applied this kind of sequence of gate teleportations on them. And uh, so, 
what, what this thing effectively does is that it will implement you this uh, sequential application of the unitaries with these random Pauli errors in between, which are determined by the results of the Bell measurements. But uh, the nice thing about this is that you don't have to wait for the states to be prepared, and you also don't have to wait for the measurements. So what you gain here is that um, you have this kind of parallelization for the price of these random Pauli errors. And this is actually something that was used in the result uh, by Terhal and Di Vincenzo, which was way ahead of its time. So this is uh, by some kind of post-selection argument. Uh, you can use this to show that you cannot simulate QNC0 circuits efficiently under some complexity theory assumptions. So what we will consider, we will consider single qubit Clifford gate teleportation circuits, and we will show that with those, you will get advantage against AC0. Okay, so we have this kind of circuit. <clears throat> so this is like a cyclic application of those gate teleportation circuits, where the inputs are these Cliffords, which are classically controlling this gates, and the outputs will be the Paulis, which are the results of the Bell measurements. <clears throat> so this circuit is trivial in QNC0, and we will consider for our problem definition something which is called possibilistic simulation, and this is like the simplest notion of simulation you can come up with, and the task is to just output any uh, Paulis P0 to Pn minus 1, which can appear with non-zero probability in the output distribution. Okay, and we will show average case result that uh, any AC0 circuit which would solve uh, this problem for uniformly random uh, chosen input of these Cliffords uh, with this kind of constant probability will need to have size at least this sub exponential. So there is a particularly nice formulation of this problem, which is that you have to satisfy this equation with the trace. And, uh, and this thing will directly imply the result that I advertised. <clears throat> okay, so how do we prove these lower bounds? We will do it by contradiction. So we will assume that you can do it. And, mm. and we will get a contradiction with the fact that you cannot, uh, that a classical strategy for Mermin Perez uh, magic square game cannot have probability of winning more than eight over nine. So first we will uh, use the random restrictions. So for this, we needed some kind of strong version of the random restrictions for which we additionally need to consider block fixing because we represent Cliffords by five bits. <clears throat> and so if we do this, then we basically end up with high probability with something which can be implemented with NC0 circuits. And for those, we already can apply some kind of light cone argument. So we end up with this kind of circuits, which has unbalanced number of inputs and outputs. But by some probabilistic argument, you can show that there are two of uh, these inputs, which has non-intersecting light cones. OK. <clears throat> and uh, so we, what we will do right now is that we will try to somehow change this problem into this formulation on which we can apply uh, some uh, this uh, non-local game type of arguments. And the way how we do it is that if you imagine that you uh, rewrite this problem in this algebraic formulation where I um, marked uh, the, the dependence on both of these light cones, there, uh, then we can use um, commutation relation between Cliffords and Paulis to, uh, and grouping of uh, both of them to transform it into the circuit that we wanted. And now I don't want you to follow this, but um, we can, we can um, do this uh, grouping and uh, commuting in a way that we don't pick up some additional dependency. So what we have right now, we end up with this kind of circuit where those are um, both F and the Gs and U and Vs are somehow grouped and uh, it might be not so easy to calculate them and uh, you might not be able to calculate them in constant depth, but we preserve this light constructure. <clears throat> and uh, so what we will do now, we will uh, play some magic square game with this circuit 
and <clears throat> the game that we will play on this circuit is Magic uh, Mermin Paris Magic Square game, which is a cooperative game of Alice and Bob. Uh, <clears throat> and there is a referee which sends them uh, two numbers, alpha and beta, which are from one to three, and they are asked to output uh, each three bits <clears throat> in a way that uh, for Alice, uh, they should be of uh, odd parity, and for Bob, they should be of even parity. And additionally to that, they should satisfy this uh, matching condition. So for X alpha and Y beta, they should be the same. <clears throat> And uh, by a simple parity argument, you can see that a classical strategy, but even with some shared randomness, cannot be win with probability more than eight over nine. But if you consider quantum players, quantum Alice and quantum Bob, which additionally shares two bell states, then they can win this game with certainty. Okay, so <clears throat> we have this kind of type of circuit where we have these uh, big measurements that are measuring these observables with which you can win this Paris Mermin magic square game. So how do we uh, use it in our scenarios? So, so this formulation of the game, it's not the only one and uh, you can have more of these magic square game measurements. And there is one which is particularly nice, which you can actually play by uh, using this uh, single qubit Clifford Gates and Bell measurement with some additional post-processing. So if we would be able to, uh, to have this simulator in AC0 for our single qubit Clifford Gates teleportation problem, then what we get is that uh, there would be a classical strategy for Mermin Perez magic square game, which will win with probability more than eight over nine. Okay, so, so this is for the noiseless case. And our main result is actually about uh, the noisy case, <clears throat> which is by a simple application by a non-standard fault tolerance scheme of Bravi, Gosset, Kenick, and Toma Michel. <clears throat> and this is only possible because the problem has this kind of nice and very simple structure. <clears throat> so the type of noise that we consider for our circuits is something which is called local stochastic noise. And this is a random Pauli noise where the errors can possibly be correlated, but the probability of the Pauli errors is dropping exponentially with the size of the support of the error. <clears throat> and so if you would try to apply some standard fault tolerance scheme on your constant depth circuit, everything will blow up. And uh, so you will not end up with constant depth circuit, which you actually want to show the quantum advantage. <clears throat> but uh, what Bravi, Gosset, Koenig, and Thomas Michel considered is that they looked into the associated uh, relation problems with the ideal circuit and for the fault tolerant circuit. And they've been able to fault some parts of this um, fault tolerant computation into the definition of the relation problem. <clears throat> so if the circuit satisfies some certain properties, you can do this thing. <clears throat> and uh, actually our single qubit gate teleportation circuits do satisfy this. So we can use this construction to transform our 1D local ideal circuits into 3D fault tolerant circuits for a modified uh, relation problem. <clears throat> for which we still can show that uh, you can have advantage against AC0. And uh, this construction leads to this iconic shape of the underlying layout of your circuit, which uh, maybe reminds you of something, it certainly does to us. And this is where the title of our paper comes from. <clears throat> okay, so this is our theorem. And so we showed that a noisy 3D local QNC0 is not contained in AC0, and uh, I will end here and take any questions you might have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions?
Oh, hello. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, sorry, I have a very fundamental question. Can you explain again what is AC0? Yes, so AC0 is constant depth classical circuit, which um, you are allowed to have unbounded fanning AND gates. So you can compute AND and OR on as many inputs as you want. So you have these two gates and you have also NOT gate. And your circuit uh, should have constant depth, which means that if you if you view your circuit as a directed graph, the path from the input, uh, from, like the longest path from any input to the output should be constant. And the size of your circuit should have polynomial size. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have another question, which uh, so basically, uh, uh, like sh as showing your work and other works, we know that if you restrict the uh, restrict the depth of the quantum circuit to be some constant, then we have some separations between quantum and the classical. Uh, so uh, my question is that can we restrict the number of qubits? For example, if uh, given if I don't restrict the depth of the circuit, but I only consider the a constant number of qubits or the constant number of bits, classical bits. Uh, can you find some using there is this is this some some separations yeah i'm not so familiar uh, with this but uh, if you have just uh, constantly many quantum bits and you are not scaling it and then uh... <clears throat> okay i don't want to guess <laughs> oh okay okay thank you thank you <clears throat> I used the chance to ask one myself in the meantime. So you were um, mentioning uh, that you were looking at possibilistic simulation, if that's correct. Um, how come you chose that over other ways of simulations? That seems um, um, a very weak form of simulation since you just need to find one output with non-zero probability. Is that correct? So it is like that you define the problem so that your classical computer has the, like it, you make it easier for your classical computer. <clears throat> so it is a weaker notion of simulation that for example, I don't know, sampling from the output distribution or strong simulation, other things. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, the same holds also for the stronger types of simulation, but we wanted to make the problem like the easiest for the classical device. Any other questions? There's a question in the back. Thank you. Um, just a simple question. Can you explain again why is, is it uh, uh, called closer? Okay, so so the layout of your fault tolerance implementation looks like this, and it reminds us of a colosseum. <clears throat> but like traditionally, people would call this kind of uh, separation exponential because. I mean, it, it's more uh, sub-exponential because you show this sub-exponential lower bound on the circuit size, but we choose to use colossal. Okay. Um, still, still not really intuitive, but yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> okay, maybe we can take um, further questions later. Um, let's thank the speaker again. <clears throat>